Yeah, just like to welcome everybody here. My name is Daniel on behalf of uh, Master Plumbers. Just like to welcome you all to tonight's webinar. Uh, as I was mentioning before, 2020 has been a pretty tough year for a lot of people. Um, uh, the first, or well, a lot of the situations we're finding ourselves in at the moment uh, have been the first for many and a long time since. Um, and I think we've still got a little way to go before we're uh, in the clear and back to some kind of normal. So um, through these times, it's really important that we look each after each other and uh, look after ourselves. So part of that is to maintain uh, some uh, mental health and, and well-being. And uh, who better to help us with that than um, one of the best in the business, Wayne Schwoss. Wayne, thanks for joining us. Daniel, my pleasure. Um, I think the issues with trying to get this Zoom meeting off the ground is indicative of the year. Stuff happens. Yeah. Some of it's out of our control. Um, you know, it, it's just been a really challenging, interesting, unprecedented year. So um, firstly, to you and to uh, the organisation, appreciate the opportunity of being able to join everybody tonight and talk about a topic which I've been talking about for well over 15 years um, and I think the topic and the importance of the conversation has always been important, but it's taken on more importance and more value in light of 2020 and the impact that COVID and the restrictions and uh, the uncertainty and uh, components of fear are, are having on individuals. So, um, you know, I, I love these opportunities because I passionately believe in the value of having these discussions and I have for a long time, but I, I believe in them for everybody that's on the, on the call. And what, I, what I'd like to do is um, to begin the conversation by saying to everybody who's on the call um, that I'm not here to tell you what to do with your life because I don't have that right. I am only responsible for the choices that I make, the decisions that I make and, and my life. Ultimately, you are responsible for whatever decisions and choices that you make. So I'm not here to tell anyone uh, what to do, but what I am here to do is I'm here to encourage you to start to think about mental health and emotional well-being um, differently to perhaps the way that we've done it historically. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've worked in this space for a long time, but and normally I would be delivering these type of presentations with live audiences. But the default position for a lot of people in the community, and I was certainly one of these, these people um, during my football career, is... Every, we, we, there's a well-being spectrum and unfortunately for a lot of us we don't start thinking about well-being or mental health until our mental health is being negatively impacted so when i'm engaging with audiences i would ask audiences you know what things come to mind when we think about mental health and it's answers like anxiety depression um, schizophrenia bipolar uh, anxiety disorder social disorder obsessive compulsive disorder people who are sick people who are um, unwell, people who are really not capable of looking after themselves or not, not being able to work. And all of those answers are actually correct. But if we think about a spectrum going across a horizontal line, that's at one end. And that end is what we call crisis. So what I want to encourage people to start to think about with regards to well-being is don't wait until we actually get unwell before we start to think about mental health and emotional well-being. So to illustrate what I mean by that is the earlier we can start to recognise and think about well-being proactive, proactively, it gives us the ability of making decisions and doing things much earlier, which prevents a mental health condition from manifesting. So I'll give you another example of what well-being can look like. Well-being uh, can look like somebody who is stressed but does not have a single sign or a symptom that indicates there might be the beginning of a mental health condition or there is a mental health condition. That's still well-being. It's still mental health. So they're in the middle of the spectrum. And then you've got people up the other end who are, who are healthy, both physically and emotionally, have no stress in their life. That is still well-being. So I want to encourage you to start to think about mental health and well-being as a spectrum. And we oscillate back and forth between being healthy, being stressed, and potentially living with mental health conditions. And I don't want people to do what I did and wait until I was unwell with multiple mental health conditions because I was in crisis. If we get to crisis, it's a much more complex, difficult, confronting situation to deal with, but it also takes you longer to start to get the necessary support, the skill set, and the confidence to begin to manage your mental health proactively and move from a position of being unwell to a position of being well. So um, 
one of the really um, important things that I, I, I talk about consistently is that th there is not a single person on this call tonight that has not been stressed in their life. Stress is part of the human experience. And why, why I'm talking about this is because stress is the fuel that lights the fire to every mental health condition. Um, yeah, and just on Daniel's point, in the chat box there, if people have got questions during the conversation, fire away, because I'll answer them. Happy for you to ask any questions. Um, stress is the fuel that lights the fire to all mental health conditions. It's the common ingredient and not a single person as an adult or even as a young person does not have to deal with stress in their life. So if we can get better at understanding what stress is, what are our stresses, what are our triggers, how does stress manifest itself both, both physically but also emotionally, what it actually allows us to do is identify stress much earlier and then make decisions to deal with that stressful situation or event. And the benefit of that is we actually can deal with stressful situations or events then and there. The problem is if we don't, what happens is stress will continue to build up and build up and build up. And stress is cumulative, which means that it can build up to the point where it completely overwhelms us. And then we can move into a position which is called a stress threshold. Everybody has a stress threshold. It's a tolerance level of how much stress you can humanly take before you can't take any more. And what happens is if we go past the stress threshold, we can move into a mental health condition, but we can also move into a position of crisis. And we don't need to do that. So understanding what causes stress, what are your stresses, what are your triggers, how do we react? And a simple example is, I was driving on Sunday uh, down uh, towards Elwood in a 60 kilometer street, and I had some peanut come screaming up the inside, would have been doing 90 to 100 Ks, and almost took the front of the car up. Now my immediate reaction is my shoulders went up, I got pissed off, I grabbed the steering wheel, and I wanted to catch the bloke at the lights and wind the window down. Now, that's, that's, that's an example that many of us will have experienced when we're, we're stressed, we're annoyed about something because the body reacts physiologically. Um, so, so that's a presentation of strength, a stress, I should say. Fortunately, the guy was a couple of cars up, so I uh, didn't get to wind down the window and give him a couple of words of advice. And in the current environment, who knows where, that, where that's gonna end up. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple example of when stress presents itself, it will present itself physically. My shoulders went up, I clenched my mouth, I started to feel frustration and anger inside of my head and my thinking because this guy had done something really stupid. I gripped the steering wheel and my response was, I wanted to go and give this guy a piece of my mind. Now, that's an example that many of us, if not all of us, can experience. That's what stress does. When we get better at identifying what does stress look like and how does it present itself physically and emotionally, we get much better at developing a level of self-awareness of when we're stressed. And the benefit of that is you can identify it and then you can make decisions to deal with that stressful situation or experience. If we don't, it can build up over a period of time and become a much bigger, more complex challenge. So one of the things that I find interesting, I'm actually gonna ask a question here and I really encourage people to put a one word answer in the box. And this is not about right or wrong, it's not about embarrassing anybody in the, on the call. You, no one's made bad decisions or poor decisions previously. But I'm, I'm very deliberately, I want to ask these questions to get you to think about your reasons because having worked in this field for 15 years, 99% of audiences that I've engaged with in 15 years are investing into one area of health. Less than 10% are investing into another area. So when I use questions, I use questions to help us make a connection if we haven't already. Because my job in these presentations is to help you start to look at health in two really important areas of your life. Because health is not reliant on one half, it's reliant on both. They're equally reliant on one another in order to be healthy and well physically and emotionally. So in the chat box, if you can put in one, one answer or one reason, why have you, why do you, why will you continue to invest into your physical health? Now, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. If you don't give me answers, that, that's okay, because I'll start throwing out some answers as well. And again, this is not about embarrassing people. It's not about making people feel uncomfortable. There's no right or wrong answer here, but I, I'm keen to understand. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. Um, I, I'm keen to understand what are the motivating reasons why you have chosen, you are right now, and you will continue to choose to invest into your physical health. So we've got more than two people on this call. Um, I can see that. What I can't see with small writing is what you write because I'm blind. 
family, fantastic from Jason. Again, similar answer from um, Daniel, which is his daughters, your kids. Pete, great answer. Longevity, quality of life. Another one from Michael, want to feel better. They're, they're all really important answers. My life, yep, I agree with that, Andrew. Um, Peter's answer is, if my body feels good, my mind feels good. I love that answer, George, too. I really love that answer because these are really important connection. And it sounds like you've already made it. But having done this for a long time, uh, one of the overriding reasons why most people invest into their physical health is because they want to live a long life with a quality of health. They also want to be um, a better version of themselves. They want to be a good partner, a good parent, a good colleague, a good manager, a good person. All of these really important motivating factors, and there's many, many more, motivate us to recognise that there's value and importance on our physical health. And most of us understand if we want to live that long life with a quality of health, then we need to be physically healthy. And that's a really, impo that's a, that's a really important rec recognition. So most people associate value and importance to their physical health. Most people understand that they need to invest into their physical health in order to be able to fulfill all of the roles and responsibilities that we have at work and at home. We want to be in our kids' lives. We want to be a good role model. We want to be a good example. We'd like to be the best husband, the best wife, the best brother, sister, friend, worker, colleague, all of these type of things. And, and so there is value and importance for all of us in relation to the reasons why we invest into our physical health and keep doing that. Um, but I'm going to ask another question. And again, I'm not trying to patronise and, and I apologise for the light, um, everyone. It's just a really difficult room to do these type of things from, but it's busy out there with other people in the room. I'm going to ask a question and the question may sound like I'm patronising you, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm very deliberately asking you to answer this question honestly because I'm helping us make a really important connection. And without knowing anyone on this call apart from Daniel... I already know the answer without knowing anybody's story. And the question is this, when you have been physically sick, when you have not been able to go to work, when you have clearly got some health issue that prevents you from actually getting up and going to work, who have you gone to see? A one word answer. And it should be the same answer from everybody. And I'm gonna turn the light on while you put those answers in there. We've all done it and we'll all continue to do it. Correct, it's the doctor. Um, and this, this lot's not too flush either. We, we, we've gone to the GP and thank you for that answer. And, and, and continue to do that. Nobody then, don't go to Dr. Google, Jace. At some point, mate, you'll, you'll need to see a GP if you haven't already seen a GP. And the reason I ask that question is this. We've already shared why we invest into our physical health, some of the reasons why we do that, because there's value and importance for us individually. But then what we've all done is we put more value and even more importance on our physical health when our health is not well. When we're physically sick, temperature, vomiting, diarrhea, aches and pains, hot and colds, unable to sleep, uh, off our food, there's a host of symptoms and signals that our body will send us. So we invest into our physical health. But then we prioritise our physical health even more when we're unwell physically. And what it proves is everyone who's been to a doctor before doesn't have the expertise or training to diagnose the underlying health issue. That's what doctors are for. But what every one of you who have been to a GP before when you've been unhealthy, and not unhealthy, unwell physically, is this. And this is very important. And I, I want you to hear this. You all have a level of self-awareness and a capacity to listen to the symptoms that your physical body is sending you. Temperature, diarrhea, vomiting, aches and pains, hot and colds, um, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of different signals. The, the body, the physical body that we live in, that is ours, sends us signals. Could be shortness of breath, could be, could, be, could be tightness in the neck, in the back, whatever it might be. These are signals and signs. And we, we have a level of self-awareness and ability to pay attention. And then what we do is we prioritize our physical health, which is being impacted negatively by making a connection that we need to get some help. We go and get help from our GP. So we pick the phone up, make an appointment, go and see them. Why? Because they've got the expertise. What's the underlying health issue? What's the treatment plan? What's my part or your part in executing it? And if you like me, before you leave, hey doc, how long before I start to feel better? Because no one likes to feel shit ass. So this is really, this is really important because every one of us on this call 
listens to our body when it's sending the signals and we act on it because we know if it gets worse, we get worse. So we don't want that to happen. So we go to the doctor to get the help as quickly as we can so we can move back to a position of being healthy and well. Fantastic. Let's park that for a moment. Can I have a, uh, a Y for a yes or an N for a no? Who owns a car on this call? I would imagine that most of us own a car. Put it in the chat box, fantastic. There we go. Almost everybody, if not everybody. Okay. Put a Y for a yes, N for a no, if you have serviced your current vehicle at some point. Great. There was one no in there. Unless that's a brand new vehicle that you've had for a week, I reckon you might want to service it at some point. Right. So not surprisingly, everyone who owns a car, or almost everyone who owns their current car, has serviced their car at some point in the past. And moving forward, we will continue to do that. Why do we do that? Because we understand that we need to service the vehicle's health. We need to invest into the preventative servicing of our vehicles to make sure that we maintain the health and well-being of our car. We prevent it from getting sick. We prevent it from breaking down. And most importantly, we prevent it from dying any sooner than it has to. Um, no, that's, that's okay, Pete. No problems at all. No problems, no problems at all. Um, we invest preventatively into servicing our vehicles to keep the cars running well, reliably, consistently, and safely all the time. Now, I'm not a mechanic. I have no idea about cars except petrol and fuel and water. It's petrol, oil, and water. But what I do know is this, that if I'm driving my car on a street or down the freeway tonight and I take my hands off the steering wheel and the, and the car starts to drift to the left-hand side, that's an indication the car physically is sending me a message. I might need a wheel alignment. Now, I don't know how to fix it, but what I do know is if I ignore that, that's going to get worse. So I've got to pay attention to the symptom and then I've got to make a connection. How do I get this fixed? Ring up Frank, my mechanic. When can I book the car in? Need a wheel alignment. Bang, he does it. We all do that. And what's interesting is um, uh, uh, if you, I'm assuming everybody's, I'm assuming this is everybody from Victoria. If not, doesn't matter. But here in Victoria, if your car breaks down on the freeway, you know you can ring the RACV, roadside assistance, because that's the GP for the car. They can come out, assess the issue. What's the treatment plan? How much is it going to cost? Can, it, can you get, get the car going? Can it get me home? So the mechanic is the GP for the car. So we invest similar, loosely speaking, we invest similar strategies to the health of our vehicles, to our physical health, because there's value and importance in both of those areas of our life. We invest similar strategies. We don't want to break down. We don't want to get sick. And we don't want to die any earlier than we have to. So we invest into our physical health. We apply similar strategies to the physical health of our vehicles. Every now and again, you put the car in for a service, the mechanic will ring you up and go, well, we've changed the tyres. We've just checked the motor. It needs a tuner. So they lift up the bonnet because the motor sits underneath the bonnet. And that might cost us a bit of money, but we understand we've got to tune the motor up because the motor is the brain of the car. It influences and impacts the physical performance of the vehicle. And if the motor's not running well, it will impact the ability of the car to perform reliably and safely, consistently. So the bonnet has the motor sitting underneath it. Now, this sounds like I'm patronising, but I'm not. This is the easiest way I could describe the disconnection for most people. I'm going to ask a question now. So physical health, ours, health of our cars, similar strategies because it's prevention. We want to stay healthy. We want to stay well. We don't want to get sick, break down or die. But I'm going to ask a question now which takes a level of authenticity and honesty from you. And it's not about right or wrong. It's not about what we've done in the past. And it's not about making people feel uncomfortable or embarrassed, but this is where I'm deliberately helping us make a connection when it comes to health. And I'm, I'm assuming here that majority of our audience are mostly males with a couple of women on here, which is great to have the ladies. The question I want to ask you with a simple why for yes or an end for no, and I really want you to be honest here. I really want you to be honest. And you haven't made any bad decisions or poor choices previously because with all due respect to everybody on the call, I'm not interested in your past because we can't change it. What I'm interested in is this conversation right now, but more importantly, what you may choose to do moving forward. So the question that I want to ask you, which requires honesty from you, why for yes and for no, is who, uh, who is investing similar time, effort and money 
that you have and you will into your physical health, that you have and you will continue into the health of your vehicles, into your mental health. A why or a no? And there's no right or wrong answers here. I really appreciate people who are putting in N for no. And you, you know what? This takes, this takes a level of courage to be able to answer this honestly. And I, I really appreciate every person that's put an N in there. And, and right now, we haven't had a why, I don't think, which is okay. Right. Here's, so I want to, is there anyone on this call that is investing into their well-being? Because if there is, and they haven't answered yet, I just want to acknowledge anyone who, yes, fantastic. Thanks, Shane. Um, fantastic. I want to acknowledge you for beginning your journey because it's really important. And also, Greg, fantastic. Fantastic. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it, but do more of it. Because if we want, to, and I want everybody to, to listen to this carefully, if we want to live the long life, with the quality of health that we want for ourselves. It's not reliant on physical health only. It's a combination of physical plus mental health that will give us the greatest opportunity of staying healthy, not breaking down, not getting sick and not dying sooner than we have to. So to Shane and Greg who have already made that connection for whatever reason, keep, keep making that connection stronger. To everybody else who hasn't yet started their journey, thank you for being honest. But here's the thing that I want to challenge you with. Again, I can't tell you what to do. But almost 90% of us have said no, that we aren't investing into our well-being. But here's, the, here's one of the questions that I want to ask you. And you don't have to answer it here. But I do want to challenge you to think about this and ask yourself this question at some point. Why is the health of your car more important than the health of your own vehicle? Why is the motor of your vehicle more important and more valuable than your own motor? And what I mean by that is this, every one of us has a vehicle. The year it was born, the year it was made, the body shape, the way that it performs. This is my carriage. Our physical body is our carriage, gets us from point A to point B. It's the wheels, it's the tires, it's the chassis, it's the windows, everything. But my motor, your motor sits right underneath our bonnet and that's right here. It's right here. And the question I'm very deliberately challenging those people who have not yet started their journey, remember you haven't done anything wrong, you haven't made poor choices. It's about what you may choose to do moving forward. Is if it's important and valuable to service your car, including its motor from time to time, then how is that more important than you looking after your own vehicle and motor? Because if you ignore your motor, it will present itself physically. I know this to be true. For those of you who may not know, I live with anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder for 10 and a half of my 14 and a half year playing career. I was physically fit, emotionally broken. I was physically strong, emotionally broken. I never compromised my physical health. It took me six years to start to prioritize my motor. The longer you take, to recognize that you need to service this the longer it takes to work back to a position of well-being. And again, I'm not trying to confront people, but I have an obligation to be honest with people. I don't want you to make my mistakes. I don't want you to ignore your mental health and emotional well-being. If you want to live a long life with a quality of health and not die any sooner than you have to, be the best father or parent that you want to be, be the best partner, be the best colleague, workmate, mate, whatever it might be, it's physical plus mental, physical plus mental physical plus emotional health that gives us the greatest chance of staying healthy and well. So if it's important and valuable to service your car, then I'm going to strongly suggest it is even more important to service your own vehicle. Physical plus mental health. So to everybody again who hasn't yet started their journey, I want to invite you to ask yourself three really simple questions over the next week or so. The sooner the better, because the longer you leave it, less chance you'll do it. As it requires honesty from you, piece of paper and a piece of uh, a pen. Number one, what's, why not? Why haven't I started investing into my mental health? And be really honest about it. Because when we know why not, we can start to make different choices. The second question is what's holding me back? What are the barriers? What are those things that are preventing me from investing into my mental health? What am I scared of? What am I fearful of? What are the things 
that I think are preventing me from making a different decision about my mental health and emotional wellbeing. And the third most important question is this, what can I do? What can I do to start to prioritise my mental health and emotional wellbeing? What are the things that have a positive impact on the way that I feel and I think? Now, I'm going to share with you some things that I do on a daily basis, and I've been doing these things for a very long time. I'm on an ongoing mental health journey, and that's 26 years and counting. I've been talking publicly for well over 15 years, um, and I've got to a position in my life uh, through a lot of challenging situations and mistakes and poor choices, um, where I've now developed a recipe that works for me. And this is really important. What works for me may not work for you. So it's really about you identifying, trying, experimenting with all the different things that we have available to us, all of us. Some are free, some might cost money. But what price do you put on your health? What price are we prepared to put on our health? So I've developed a recipe over the 26 year period, which allows me to look after my mental health and emotional wellbeing. And I make decisions every single day, every single day, because my health is my responsibility. Your health is your responsibility. I and you rely on our support network. But if we rely on our support network to make decisions for us, then we're leaving it to chance. So I need my support network, but I've accepted that I have to own my, my, my health. It's my responsibility. So I make decisions every day in order to be healthy and well as often as I possibly can. Now, the recipe that I've, I've been able to develop over a long period of time is I have an internal checklist which allows me to very quickly audit what's going on in my life if I start to feel stressed, overwhelmed, or I'm not able to cope. And invariably, what these things will identify is I tend to work too much, which means I'm saying yes too often and no, not enough. I'm not sleeping as well as I can. I'm not eating as well as I should. I'm either not exercising as often as I, I should and would like to, or I'm not exercising at all. And if these things, uh, if I don't pay attention to these things, then what will happen over a period of time is I'll get really stressed, I'll get overwhelmed, and then I'm increasing the probability of anxiety coming back into my life. So my checklist allows me to identify what are my stresses, what are my triggers, and what's actually happening. And the value of that is I can start to make very quick decisions I need to back off work a bit. I need to eat more. I need to eat better. I need to get more sleep. I need to start exercising. And I just need to start prioritizing my mental health and emotional well-being. So I've already hinted on a couple of things, a few things that I do. Number one thing that I do for myself is I prioritize my sleep. So the sleep's the most important thing that I do. So if I've got an early morning and a big day or a late night, or I've got a really busy period coming up, it's not uncommon for me to be in bed at 8 or 8.30. I just need to get some sleep. In order to continue to prioritize my sleep, what I've done is for a period of two years, I didn't drink alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant, lowers your mood. There's enough research to support the argument that alcohol interrupts our ability to get quality sleep. So I made a decision uh, up until earlier this year where I chose to be off alcohol completely because I wanted to prioritize my mental health and emotional well-being, and I wanted to eliminate the things that weren't helping me. By eliminating alcohol, I increased my probability of getting quality sleep. I now enjoy a couple of glasses of wine a couple of times during the week, but I moderate what I drink. Um, and I'm very conscious of doing that. And I'm not telling anyone what to do who enjoys the drinks. It's entirely up to you what you choose to do. But the reality is alcohol is a drug. It's a legalized drug which interrupts your sleep patterns. And it doesn't allow us to get quality sleep. So the choice is for me, eliminate alcohol, get better sleep, means I'm rested. If I have uh, at various stages of my life used alcohol as a way of dealing with stress and coping, um, what happens is um, I have poor sleep. I get really tired, not surprisingly. I start to get agitated. I have less patience. And then what will invariably happen is these periods of over overwhelming sadness will drift into my life. And I know what that is. It's the entry into a bout of anxiety. So the choice is simple. If I drink the way I used to, I'm increasing the probability of anxiety coming back into my life. So I choose to moderate how much I drink I still enjoy having a couple of glasses and socialising with friends, but I don't use alcohol as a really big influence in my life because I don't want to invite anxiety back in. It's just the choice I make. I had a really healthy, well-balanced diet. 
not surprisingly, um, you do your research, a healthy, well-balanced diet, whether it's vegan, vegetarian, where it's carnivore, where it's protein, where it's a mixture of all sorts of different things. Mediterranean is the most popular diet, um, which the research validates is good for our well-being and our health. But if you eat poorly and drink poorly, you're going to feel and think poorly. If you eat better or properly, if you drink and you drink, you're giving your body and your mind the good things that it needs, you will naturally start to feel and think more positively towards yourself. And what I learned about 18 months ago interviewing a nutritionist on our podcast, the Pucker Up podcast, is we have a second brain and it's our gut health. Now, I want you to listen. Our gut health influences the way that we think and we feel. It influences the way we think and we feel. Our gut bacteria is talking to our brain and our brain is talking to our gut bacteria. So if we're eating poorly and drinking poorly, then our gut bacteria will be poor. Well, not surprisingly, we'll be thinking and feeling poor about ourselves. Yet if we start to change the way that we eat, and we give our body and our mind the nutrients that it needs, we will naturally start to think and feel better in a more positive sense. So think about what we're eating and what we're consuming. And just on consumption, there's one other really important area that I want you to think about. Not only do I watch what I eat and I drink, I watch, I'm mindful of what I consume. TV, radio, and print. I shut down my Twitter account, 25,000 um, followers last year. Why? Because it's negative. And I noticed that I was starting to be negatively impacted with the way that I felt and my thoughts because I was on Twitter. So I made a decision to get off it. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna open up an account. Don't need to be in that space. I watch one news cycle, Channel 9 is my news. I get up in the morning, I watch the seven o'clock or 7.30 news bulletin just to get an update of what, what's happened the last 24 hours. I don't watch the news again. I don't watch the nightly news. I don't read the newspapers. I don't have the radio on. I listen to SEN because that's how I, I hear about footy, but I don't consume any other media. Why? Because not only is food, poor choice, uh, poor food and poor beverages and drinks poor for us, but the content we consume can be positive or negative. I just eliminate out negative content so it doesn't impact my ability to be healthy and well. That's something that I'd encourage you to think about doing. Exercise, I'm 51. I know I don't look it. I look amazing. And I think I look really good in like that. I'm one of these middle-aged men that love cycling. Now, I don't care what your exercise is. A walk, a run, a jog a swim, a bike ride, get outside and read a book. Don't care what it is, rock climbing, don't care. What I care about is move your body because the body reacts physiologically. It's good for us physically, it's good for us mentally, it's good for us emotionally. And if we haven't exercised for a while, what you can do tomorrow is you can get up 15 minutes early, you can put your walking shoes on, your track suit, and you can go outside and walk for 10 minutes. And then on Friday, walk for 15. Saturday, 20, Sunday, 25, Monday, 30. And before you know it, you're walking for an hour. And just notice how better you feel about it. Sense of accomplishment, you've achieved something, helping to lose a little bit of weight, maybe getting a little bit fitter. You just naturally start to feel better. I ride my bike for three really important reasons. Number one, physical benefits. Any form of exercise is good for us physically. Number two, my friends. They're my, I love riding my bikes with my mates. It's a sense of connection. It helps me feel good, helps me feel connected, I'm happy. The third most important reason that I exercise is because of the mental clarity it gives me. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've had an issue or stress in my life at work or at home with no idea of how do I solve this? What's the workaround? What's the solution? And I'll jump on my bike and I'll go for a ride. And the reason why I think, and this is an assumption, the reason why I think I've been on a bike ride so many times with an issue in my life and during the bike ride, remembering I'm doing something that I love, I'm benefiting physically, I have no distractions. I'm doing something that I love. I'm not on the phone. People can't find me. They can try, but they won't find me. I'm enjoying it, but I have no distractions, which means I'm free to think. And the number of times that I've had a thought of a solution or a workaround come into my mind when I've been on my bike is ridiculous. So they're the reasons why I ride my bike. And I don't care what people do, but I want people to do something because a lack of movement and a lack of activity is not good for us physiologically but also emotionally. The other two things that I do um, is that I'm clearly someone who's comfortable talking. I've not always been a talker. I'm a 51 year old male that's grown up in a world that has told him and taught him and conditioned him that men don't cry, men don't show emotion, men aren't vulnerable and they don't talk about stuff. We talk about safe topics, sport, footy, work, kids, all of those things. I've realized, and I'm not sure if this is a predominantly male 
audience, but I'm assuming that it is predominantly male and I'm not being disrespectful to the ladies. Fellas, I've spent the last six years reconnecting emotionally. So I, I'm going, I've gone through some really challenging personal situations this year and I've reached out to the people that I trust and care about the most and I've asked them for their support. I've engaged them in discussion. I'm not trying to hold it all in because if I try to hold it all in, which I did for a very long time, it has a dramatically negative impact on the way that I feel and I think. It's not worth that. So I've learnt the skills to be able to communicate about what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, and how do I talk about that? Now, the other thing, and I'm going to wrap it up shortly and ask any questions, answer any questions that people might have. This might be challenging uh, for, for the majority of the audience. And I can, I can accept and respect the fact that we might have differences of opinions on this. But the greatest thing that I have done for myself as a middle-aged man, a father of three kids, including a 13-year-old son, a business owner, a mate, a son, a brother, a friend, is that through my entire adult life up until about the age of 45 to 46, I was taught, educated, and conditioned to believe that men are not meant to be vulnerable and emotional. And men that are vulnerable and men that do show emotion and the emotion that I'm really talking about is the ability to cry. Well, they're judged. They're seen as weak. You're soft. You're sook. You're not tough enough. You're not man enough. You're not hard enough. This is a narrative which has been handed down for generations from generations from generations. And I'm not, I'm not trying to blame. I'm not trying to blame our parents. I'm not trying to bl blame grandparents. I'm not trying to blame people that may have influenced us along the same way. But here's the reason why this has been never more important. We lose almost three times the number of people to suicide than we do our national road toll every year in Australia. And uh, on average, up until last year, we lose eight people to suicide every day in Australia. And six of those eight are men. And the most common message I get from men all over the country and even around the world uh, when they reach out to me is I'm scared. I'm scared of being judged. I'm scared of being seen as weak and I haven't talked to anybody. <clears throat> there are so many men around our world in this country who are in pain, who are hurting, but are absolutely shit scared of being vulnerable and emotional because of judgment. And it's killing men. That is the root cause of what's happening. So I've made a decision over the last five to six years to reconnect emotionally. So I'm happy, I laugh, I have fun, I put a bit of shit, my mates put shit on me. Um, I can get angry, I can get upset, I, I upset as in frustrated and pissed off. And these, are, these, these are emotions that a lot of us are comfortable expressing because we know we're not being judged for it and we're expected to behave in this way. But what I've very deliberately done is that I've reconnected emotionally. I'm strong, stoic, resilient, tough, hardworking, I'm reliable, I'm trustworthy, I'm a man's man. I'd like to think that I'm a mate's mate. I'm your normal, typical 51-year-old Kiwi living in Australia type of guy. But I'm also loving, caring, nurturing, compassionate, empathetic. I'm not afraid of being vulnerable. I'm not afraid of being emotional. And, and, and to everybody, I've cried more in the last eight months than I have in my entire adult life. And I don't care what people think. Why? Because that's important to me. That allows me to tap into my emotions with what I'm experiencing and work my way through that. One of the main reasons why I've cried so much is that I lost my great mate, Danny Frawley. Um, but this ability to be emotional and, and give myself permission to cry was something that I, had, I didn't have a connection to for such a big part of my life. I've worked my backside off reconnecting emotionally. And the reason why I think that's important is for two, two important reasons. Number one, if you don't think that this is important to you as a, as a human being, but I'm going to skew it towards the, the boys in this call. If you don't think this is important to you, well, that's your choice, but I'd strongly disagree. But it's never been more important for our next generation of men and women. And if you've got sons and daughters, what are we doing as a parent? Are we handing down the same messages that have been handed down to us? And are we putting those same expectations on our kids? Or are we going to change the environments that we give our kids the opportunity of growing up in that empowers them to be emotionally connected and expressive? That's a question you need to ask yourself. I, I want to encourage you to think about that. But I played footy through an era where we were, the messages every day, don't be weak, don't be soft, don't be soup, don't be a girl, harden up, toughen up, 
be a man. That's not how a man behaves. Don't you dare show emotion. Don't you cry. If you cry, they'll see you as weak. Your teammates won't trust you and they won't want to play with you. These were messages that I was force fed every year, every day through my entire career. I love my career. I'm not blaming anyone, but I was conditioned to disconnect emotionally as a man because emotional men are weak. That's not true. Emotional men are strong. They've got a full toolbox of emotions to express and communicate what they think and they feel. That's empowering. But if you don't think it's important to you, I disagree with that. It's never been more important to our kids because the greatest gift we can give our children are parents who are emotionally connected and expressive. Why? Because it shows through our behavior that this is normal behavior and our kids mirror what the parents behave and how they behave. I'm a flawed parent. I've made a lot of mistakes. But one decision I'm incredibly proud of, it's the most important decision that I've, I've made since our kids were born. I have never said one of those toxic, destructive messages that were given to me through my football career to any one of my children. Why? I don't want to condition them. I don't want to rob them of being emotionally connected and expressive. I want to empower them. And I'd like to think that we live in a world that has the potential of supporting and responding to our daughters in the same way we do as our son. I've never told my son or our daughters to stop crying, to cut it out. That's not how you behave. I've just let them cry. And I've proactively had conversations with our kids, but especially my son, about the importance and value of crying. Why do I do that? Because I want my son to grow up thinking and believing and behaving that this is what men do too. Because at some point, life's going to sit him on his ass, like my daughters. I want them to feel pain. I want them to hurt and I want them to cry. But then what I want them to do is talk to people about it, ask for help, put their hand up and ask for help. Don't do what I did and shut it down because that makes the whole situation so much worse. And in finishing, I want to challenge you with this. When I deliver uh, in person, I ask uh, a, a question very deliberately. It's an informal way of doing market research. And the question that I ask is I invite the audiences to stand up if they can remember a time when they were a young girl or young boy around about the age of eight, nine or 10 where they were doing something that didn't matter what you, do, you, you were doing, but you fell off, fell out or fell over. You felt pain, it hurt, and you straight away started to cry. It was a natural reaction. And then what you did is you re went to an influential adult, probably mum and dad, or it might have been a coach or a teacher, because you knew that the adult would look after you, they'd take care of you, and if it was mum and dad, they'd love you, they'd clean you up, you might have had a bandage on your arm because you took some skin off, whatever it might be. Once they got you patched up and you calmed down, they gave you a kiss on the head, pat on the bum or a hug, told them you'd be okay, and you went back to doing what you were doing. Now, due to help, during that whole process, you weren't sitting there going, sook, toughen up, got to be a man, got to harden up, can't be a girl. You don't have that thought because we don't have that thought process because we're born emotionally connected and expressive. Boys and girls, different genders, but we are born the same. We're connected human beings, but we get conditioned to think differently because of other people's expectations. But that young girl or young boy didn't sit there and judge themselves negatively, nor were they sitting there worried about whether a mum or dad or the teacher or the coach thought that they were soft, or soft, not tough enough, all that stuff, because we don't have that internal dialogue. So I ask audience to stand up if they can remember an experience like that. And not surprisingly, almost 100% of audiences, all, always mixed, male and, male and female, always stand up, almost 100%. Then I ask the follow-up question, who's continued to behave that way as they've grown up and less than 10% of people stay standing? less than 10%. And what really stand, uh, uh, saddened me is that just as many women are being conditioned as men are. And the, the, the reason for asking those questions is this, we are born emotional, expressive human beings. That is what we're capable of, boys and girls. But as we start to grow up and become teenagers, adults, parents, we are taught and conditioned that we've got to stop being emotionally connected and expressive human beings. It proves to me that human beings are being conditioned from past generations, workplaces, coaches, teachers, because of their expectations. If we don't change the narrative for the next generation, we're gonna have this ongoing issue, which is an epidemic of people taking their lives. I don't want that. I don't think anyone on this call wants that. So what are we saying to ourselves and what are we saying to our kids? So I'm gonna leave you with two challenges. Next time your kid cries, let her or him cry. Don't say anything, don't tell them to stop, don't judge them, don't criticize them. Just let them be a human being. And then once they've calmed down, engage in a discussion if you're comfortable. How did that make you feel? Why is that important? Change the dialogue. 
create a new narrative in the home that empowers all of us, including ourselves, to be emotionally connected and expressive. The final thing that I want to challenge you on is this. I would argue there's not an adult on this call who hasn't cried in front of another person as a grown person and said sorry. And the reason why we say sorry is because we've been taught to believe that that's what we have to do. So next time we, we, we're emotional, next time we're vulnerable, and next time we, we know that we're about to cry, give yourself permission to cry. And you'll feel this urge from your subconscious to say this word, sorry. Before you say it, catch it and swap it out with thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for allowing me to be in this space. Thank you for not judging me. We are conditioned to believe that we have something to be sorry about when we are vulnerable and emotional and we cry. Stop it because we don't have anything to be sorry about. We haven't done anything wrong. We've just been conditioned and taught to believe that this is the way that we are meant to behave. There is a big kid in every adult in this call. I'm still a big kid. And I've stopped worrying about what people think about me if I'm vulnerable and emotional. As I said, I've cried more in the last eight months than I have in my entire adult life and I haven't said sorry, but I've said a lot of thank yous. And as a 51 year old male, after I lost Spud, I've told the six closest male men in my life Two days after Spud passed, how much I love them, how much they mean to me, and why they're important to me. And I continue to do that daily. Why? Why, why can't a man give and receive love? We live in a world that allows and supports women to give and receive love. What's important to us? So if people want to judge me negatively or see me differently because I'm emotionally connected and expressed, I don't care. I care about my, the people that I, my family and my friends and the people that I trust and value the most. But if people want to judge me differently, then that's fine. I'm not going to let it bother me because I'm living my life the way that I want to live it. I love what I do. Um, I feel very fortunate to have gone through the experiences that I've gone through because it's been the greatest journey of self-discovery. I'm not perfect, but I like the person that I am and that I'm becoming. I've learned to connect emotionally. Um, I'm doing a job that changes lives positively and saves lives. And um, I appreciate the opportunity of spending some time with you tonight. And to Daniel, thanks again um, to everybody that's given up. I know that things are busy. There's a lot going on personally and professionally. But to give up your time and join the conversation, I just want to thank everybody for, for doing that tonight. And if you haven't yet started the journey, just tonight or tomorrow is a good day to start your wellbeing journey. Because the moment you start, the moment you are putting your mental health and emotional wellbeing first. So all the best with it. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are. Otherwise, I'll shut up. Daniel, over to you. <laughs> thanks, mate. Yeah, just on behalf of uh, Master Plumbers and everybody that's uh, on the call, thanks again for giving up your uh, time to, to share your experiences and, and give us a little bit of a uh, heads up on, on how we can manage ourselves moving forward. Um, I'll just put down a couple of notes here just while people think of anything they might like to ask, any questions uh, we'll, we'll have, have a go at. But just in particular, the current um, times we're going through at the moment, uh, being locked inside with the, the COVID madness is sort of uh, starting to wear a little bit thin on people. And, and, and then you see uh, a little bit of um, complacency set in and, and of course the numbers will pick back up again. Um, have you got any tips for people that are sort of getting to the end of their patience, I guess you could say, with um, how they've been dealing with the whole situation? Yep. Whatever you feel, whatever you think is relevant for you. It's not wrong. It's relevant for you. You're entitled and you should be giving yourself permission to feel and think and experience whatever it is that you're feeling. Because this is, this is an unprecedented experience that we are all going through. And we will, we will respond and we will react in different ways. You have, you, you have nothing to apologise for. Um, you've done nothing wrong because we all deal with stress in different ways. And I think what's really important is just to give yourself permission. What am I feeling? What am I experiencing in this moment? And just acknowledge that. If you feel that it's starting to have a negative impact on the way that you feel and you think, then talking to somebody that you trust is really important. Talking to a GP, making the effort to actually connect with people and discuss what it is that you're thinking and experiencing and one of, the, one of the worst things that we could possibly do is ignore what we're thinking and what we're feeling, especially if it's having a negative impact on us. Because the longer we ignore it, the more potential it's going to have a bigger impact. So just acknowledging our feelings and our thoughts, not apologising for it, 
Um, and 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 I'll also throw into that, Daniel, is, is finding a way. If people, I, I think some people are actually, um, you know, going to have to move back to working from home because of certain restrictions and certain postcodes. Break up your day. Break up your day. Find some separation between home life and work life. That's easier said than done. But one simple strategy I use regularly is when I'm feeling stressed and it's sunny, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll go outside for 15 minutes and just sit in the sun. Whatever little hacks that work for you work, implement them into your daily, uh, your daily activities to give yourself an opportunity of getting some separation, but also prioritizing your mental health and emotional wellbeing. And you, you've covered off my second dot point I've got there is managing the transition to uh, a different working environment for most people yeah. working from home or in a, yeah. uh, a disconnected environment where you don't see your colleagues and, and friends as much as what you usually do. I've found personally that um, that's one of the things I did miss the most when I was working from home is getting up out of my chair and going down and having a chat to the other people downstairs and, yep. and uh, not having that sort of takes a, a lot of your energy away in being able to be productive and, yep. and, and get on what you, with what you need to do in the day. Well, I've got a couple of things I can throw into that. When I, when I was, I'm clearly working from the office now, but when I was working from home, um, I, I, think, I think the most important thing uh, that we can do when we are working from home is accept the situation. So many people are in the same boat. There's very little we can do about this. This is being forced upon us and it's no fault of anyone. So accepting that this is the situation alleviates some of the stress that you might be experiencing. And this sounds really simple and might be even stupid, but I had the same working uh, daily routine when I was working at home like I would normally. And that is I get up, I watch the news cycle, I then have a shower, I have breakfast and I got changed into work clothes even though I was working from home. And then every hour, every hour and a half, I'd get up, I'd either go outside and uh, I'd have 10 or 15 minutes with my son uh, with basketball. I'd make a coffee, I'd talk to my wife. Um, I'd just do things to break up the routine. I'd go outside, I'd sit in the sun. And one suggestion um, that a local government uh, organisation I was doing some work for earlier this year said to me was, that again it sounds really silly but this this is a this is a silly time that we're living through and they said i missed getting up from my desk and walking around the other side of the office and talking to somebody so what they decided to do eventually was before every meeting that they had on zoom they got up they walked around the block came back sat back down it's not the same but they tried to replicate that experience of getting up from their desk walking around to meet the other person and then they'd have zoom and the other thing that i think is really important with working from home um, we took all of our meetings online, Zoom or FaceTime. And as a manager and as a leader and a business owner, that was really important. Really important because it, it helped us stay connected. But the most important benefit of Zoom or FaceTime for me as a business owner was that I could see the visual cues of my staff in real time. And if I thought that they were tired, stressed or not coping, I could see the cues and I could have a separate conversation offline. So I think that whilst this is a really difficult time, technology gives us enormous and really beneficial opportunity of staying connected with one another. So use them and use them often. Well, um, I think there's, this, as I mentioned before, there's still a little way to go. I think with uh, a lot of people, especially us Victorians, that uh, everyone seems to dislike at the moment. <laughs> but um, I'm sure with a little bit of uh, concentration and cooperation, we'll we'll get through the other side and uh, yeah. see and do things that we uh, used to do before all this started. So Yeah. i got um, one just question. Can I answer one more sure. question? Can on. This one, this one's from Jason and I appreciate the honesty wanting to get some tips about getting off alcohol. Um, I, I, the way, the, the way that I, I was able to do it, um, Jason was, it's, it's hard to stop doing something if we don't have something to replace it with. Um, and sometimes it might be unrealistic to think about, you know, if, if, if we drink regularly and we drink a lot, you know, the challenge of trying to go cold turkey is really difficult. So let's just say, hypothetically speaking, it might be, I don't know, it might be a bottle of wine at night or it might be six stubbies at night. Well, the way that I would approach it is tomorrow night, I'm going to have a half a bottle of wine or three stubbies. And then by the end of the week, I want to be down to one glass of wine and one or one stubby. 
small incremental changes over a longer period of time increase your probability of being able to achieve the goal. What's also, and, and this, this, this can be challenging, but it's a, it, it, sometimes we need to be selfish. So what I did when I didn't drink for two years was I didn't go out. And in, in the beginning, my mates would give me a hard time. Why aren't you coming out? Coming out a few beers. But I just, I was honest. I said, boys, I'm trying to stop drinking. If I go out, I know I'm going to drink. I'm not, that's not going to, that's not going to work for me. And then after a few months, my mates got used to me not drinking and they accepted me for that. So that, that's, they're the things that I'd be doing. But also, you know, if, if you like to go home and have a drink of a night time, think about what could I do when I get home? What could I do differently that doesn't put me in that same situation where I want to drink? And it just becomes about habit forming. And, um, you know, I, I went through a period oh, two and a half years ago where I drank every day for six months and just became a habit and a routine. But I reckon once I got past the first couple of weeks, you know, I could walk past any bottle shop or any pub and have no urge to go in there. It's just about being disciplined, understanding that I need to make these decisions to be healthy and to be happy again. And who knows, you might get off alcohol for a period of time and then get to a position where you can enjoy a couple of drinks. But if, if you think, Jason, that it is having a negative impact, that's the most important thing to be able to recognise, that it's, it's not helping me, so what can I do to change that and help myself? Once again, Wayne, really appreciate you giving up your time to uh, address the audience here and uh, we'll be sharing the video with uh, with our members and the rest of our audience that wasn't able to make the time. We're still getting used to the whole Zoom webinar thing and trying to find the sweet spot for uh, the time where we'll get the biggest audience. But um, everybody's got their, their time during the day where they're able to um, uh, to tune in and, and take in the messages that you've got. So. Once again, on behalf of Master Plumbers and everyone that's joined us, I really appreciate you uh, giving up your time and, and sharing your experience and your messages. My pleasure, Daniel. Thanks to you. Thanks to everybody who was on the call and thanks to anyone who watches it down the track. If you're not, if you're not looking after yourself, tomorrow's a great day to start. So look after yourself, everybody. Take care. Take care, guys. See you next time.